In the early hours of New Year's Day 2013, tragedy struck young parents Jordan Monaghan and Laura Gray when their 24-day-old baby, Ruby, was found dead in her Moses basket. Merely eight months later, their 21-month-old son, Logan, was also found dead in his pushchair after a trip to the swimming pool with his father. Six years after that, in 2019, Jordan Monaghan's new partner, Evie Adams, died by an overdose of prescription medication in an apparent suicide. How could one man suffer such misfortune, losing three loved ones in the space of seven years? Was the tragic loss of these three precious lives truly an unfortunate tragedy? Or could one man be responsible for all three deaths? Jordan Monaghan was born in July of 1991 and lived in Blackburn in Lancashire. Little is known about Jordan's upbringing, but in his later years he worked in construction, driving diggers, and he was said to have a problematic relationship with gambling, and it wasn't uncommon for him to miss bill payments due to his love of fruit machines. Laura Gray was born in November of 1992, and she had been best friends with Jordan's younger sister whilst growing up in Blackburn. When she was younger, she had a huge crush on Jordan, and over time, they began dating when they were in school. When Laura was just 16, her dreams of a perfect family started to come true when Jordan got down on one knee to propose. One year later, they moved in together, where Jordan got a job in construction, and Laura started working in a care home. During this time, Laura said she saw no red flags in their relationship, and that this was a very happy time. Jordan was well liked by her friends and family, and Laura knew that Jordan was the man she wanted to start a family with. Laura Gray was desperate to be a mother, saying that she was determined to give her children everything she never had. Her wish was granted on the 17th of November 2011, when baby Logan Patrick Monaghan was welcomed into the world. Logan was described by family as a beautiful little monkey and was so mischievous. He was said to have a beautiful smile. Laura was so happy she was finally a mother to her little boy, and Jordan was said to be a really great and doting dad. Jordan carried on working whilst Laura became a stay-at-home mother. Logan was described as Laura's dream child, and there was absolutely no concerns for his health, and he was a happy, healthy, and bouncy baby boy. During Laura's second pregnancy, however, her perfect family life seemed to start falling apart. Jordan's gambling addiction was beginning to get noticeably out of hand, with court documents noting that his persistent spending, financial irresponsibility, and lack of candour concerning money left bills unpaid. At this point, she realised that Jordan had been lying to her for many months, and they were constantly arguing about money. This ultimately led to Laura trying to end the relationship on the 23rd of September 2012. Later that day, however, Laura received a phone call from a panicked Jordan, who told her that Logan had swallowed some paracetamol tablets and wasn't moving or responding. Laura and Jordan rushed their baby boy to the hospital, but they were unable to find any problems with Logan, and thankfully, Logan seemed okay and was taken back home. Following this scare, the couple actually reconciled, and on the 8th of December 2012, their second child, Ruby Julie Monaghan, was born. Less than a month later though, tragedy struck the young family. After Ruby's birth, Laura was in high spirits and said that she enjoyed the best Christmas ever with her own little family. A few days after Christmas, however, on the 29th of December 2012, Laura's blood ran cold when she heard Jordan shouting for her to come downstairs as Ruby appeared to be having difficulty breathing. She had been upstairs doing laundry, so she quickly ran downstairs and saw Jordan holding a completely lifeless baby Ruby. Little Ruby was rushed to the hospital in an ambulance and was kept for three days under observation. The initial diagnosis was that she had suffered an episode of temporary pause in her breathing due to a viral respiratory infection. The ultimate diagnosis was early bronchitis, and so it was not ruled that there should be a police investigation. So on the afternoon of the 31st of December, Ruby was discharged from the hospital. Later that evening, after cuddling up with a film and seeing the New Year in together, Jordan told Laura that he would do Ruby's 2am feed and that she could go to bed to get some sleep. 
However, Laura's sleep was dramatically cut short when Jordan cried out again at 1.45am to tell her that Ruby was not breathing. An ambulance arrived at 2.13am, but it was too late. Despite their best efforts, the paramedics were unable to revive Ruby's tiny, lifeless body and she was tragically pronounced dead at 2.45am on the morning of the 1st of January 2013. Naturally, a routine police investigation was done, which meant that both Laura and Jordan were interviewed by the police. Post-mortem investigations were unable to identify a probable cause of death. There was no evidence of injury or assault, or in fact of any suspicious circumstances at all. With no obvious explanation, Ruby's death was attributed to natural causes and it was ruled as acute bronchopneumonia. Following Ruby's death, Laura was of course distraught and she relied on Jordan a lot for support in the upcoming months. While Laura said she crashed completely, Jordan planned the funeral, returned to work and carried on as normal, seemingly being strong for both of them. The couple focused on putting all their love into Logan and the tragedy initially brought Laura and Jordan back together. However, it wasn't long before their money problems started to cause issues in their relationship once again. Overwhelmed with grief, Laura tried again to end the relationship with Jordan on the 26th of July 2013. The next day, Jordan rang Laura to say that Logan had gone all floppy and collapsed. She rushed home to find her son clammy and not really moving, so Jordan called an ambulance and Logan was taken to hospital where he was found to be normal but with a slightly raised heart rate. It was concluded that Logan's breathing difficulties may have been caused by an upper respiratory tract infection and that he may have been suffering from sunstroke, and so he was discharged the following day. Although Laura considered the relationship to be over, Jordan persuaded her to give him another chance. A few weeks later though, on the 16th of August, Laura was reaching her limit with Jordan's gambling problem. She discovered that Jordan had amassed a debt of £2,000 on a credit card that Laura knew nothing about. She confronted Jordan, asking him how he got this debt, and he revealed that he had not been making rent payments due to his gambling and fruit machine addiction. The couple had a large argument, and Laura told him once again that she was leaving him. The next day, on the 17th of August, Laura told Jordan she wasn't feeling very well, so Jordan said he would take Logan out in his pushchair so that Laura could catch up on some sleep, and so Jordan and Logan left for the Wave swimming pool in Blackburn. At around 2.45pm, Jordan returned home with Logan, who was apparently sleeping in his pushchair. Jordan asked Laura if he could stay for dinner before leaving the family home, to which Laura agreed. Jordan told Laura to wake up their son, who was still in his pushchair, which he had left in the corner of the room, whilst he went out to buy some pizzas. Once Jordan had left, Laura walked over to the pushchair to wake up her son, but tragically, as she pulled away the rain cover, she knew instantly that little Logan was gone. I knew the moment I lifted the rain cover. I knew when I looked at him, I knew he'd passed away, said Laura. She immediately tried CPR, but that didn't work, so paramedics were called and an ambulance rushed Logan's limp body to the hospital, but there was nothing that could be done and Logan Monaghan was pronounced dead at 6pm on the 17th of August 2013. Post-mortem examinations were once again unable to determine the cause of his death. Slight changes to his lungs suggested that maybe he was developing pneumonia, but that wouldn't explain the sudden cause of death. With no brain injury or any other damage, it was very difficult to say what had killed Logan. One of several possible explanations was that there had been an imposed airway obstruction by a third party, but ultimately his cause of death was left unascertained. Despite the medical experts stating that both children's deaths were due to natural causes, the police were extremely suspicious. The murder of a child or children is extremely complex to try and investigate. It's particularly challenging in an investigation when you have medical experts that are saying that the child has died through natural causes. As a police officer, if you have that gut feeling that actually this medical expert is wrong, then you would do all you can to try and disprove that medical expert. You need to pull together and build this picture to show that this is a suspicious death and not a natural death. The death of two children from the same family within an eight-month period 
did start to raise red flags. The fact that Logan Monaghan was the second child to die whilst in Jordan's care was raised to the authorities and Jordan Monaghan became a person of interest behind closed doors. Any death of a child under the age of 18 is investigated by the police and social care and health. Now when a second child dies within the same family, particularly in a short period of time, that really does raise concerns. But to have two children die on you within a six month period is highly concerning and needs investigating thoroughly. Laura was beyond distraught and suffered a self-described breakdown. Ultimately, she was admitted to a hospital for psychiatric care and it was during her stay at the ward that her relationship with Jordan once again rekindled. Jordan would visit Laura every day in the hospital and she said that he was the link to my two children, the only one who knew how I truly felt. The couple were interviewed by various British media, telling the tragic story of their two children being ripped away from them by unknown causes. Jordan, who was now 22, told reporters that biopsies were going to take up to three months to come back with results regarding his and Laura's genetics, as there may be a hereditary reason for their deaths. Regarding this, Laura said that she panicked that it was something to do with her own genes and vowed to not have any more children to avoid a repeat of her indescribable trauma. Laura began to worry for her sister's four-month-old child, fearing for his health. During these media interviews, Jordan posed for pictures and spoke to newspapers about the tragedy of losing two children. He told reporters, It feels as if history is repeating itself. Everything has been taken away from us. We can't believe this has happened for a second time. We are just in shock and completely devastated. The second tragic loss and Jordan's dedication to Laura's emotional well-being seemed to bring the childhood sweethearts back together and in May of 2016, a third child was born. The child's name has been withheld from most publishings for legal reasons. Things seem to be getting better, but on the day of the third child's christening, Laura saw Jordan using a fruit machine and this led to a massive blowout between the two. Laura ended their tumultuous relationship yet again, adding that Jordan was allowed to see the child, despite their romance ending. The next week, Laura was upstairs when she heard Jordan shouting. She ran downstairs to find Jordan holding their daughter, who had her eyes closed and was limp in her father's arms. By the time the paramedics arrived, the little girl appeared to have recovered. She was taken to hospital where she remained for observation and testing. She was discharged two days later, but once again there was no explanation as to why she had collapsed. On the 2nd of October, Jordan was watching the child in the house alone when Laura got a phone call. It was Jordan once again, alerting her to the fact that their child was not breathing. Once again, Laura raced the paramedics to the house and found the child in a state of reduced consciousness. But her condition improved and within a few minutes she had recovered. She was taken to the hospital where she remained for nine days. However, once again, no significant medical issues were identified. This was the moment though that Laura finally put her foot down and permanently ended this on again and off again nightmare. However, the authorities were incredibly suspicious at this point and Laura's daughter was removed from her care by a court order. Authorities continued to review Ruby, Logan and now the third child's cases getting expert opinions from various fields to ascertain what it was that kept hurting these children. Neurologists, cardiologists, specialists in disease and genetics, respiratory medicine and paediatrics concluded that in each child's case there was no natural explanation for the collapses. The terrifying results suggested that despite no clear signs of injury, the most obvious and logical explanation was that a unified covert mechanism had stopped their breathing, most likely by smothering both the nose and the mouth to obstruct the airways. I have absolutely no idea why it took them this long, but five years after the deaths of both Ruby and Logan on January 2018, police officially launched a murder investigation into the deaths of the children and the sudden collapse of the third child. In April of 2018, Jordan Monaghan was arrested and brought in for questioning in connection of the deaths of his two children. During this interview, he denied smothering the children or causing any of the collapses. He stated his relationship with Laura was good most of the time and said he did not know what caused the children to become so poorly. Frustratingly, however, 
Jordan was later released on bail with conditions, as there was not enough physical evidence to charge him. It's extremely frustrating when you have your suspect in custody and you know for sure that that person is responsible, but the evidence isn't quite there. You only have that finite time to keep them in custody before you can either charge them or release them. And on this particular occasion, you're forced to make a decision, which is to release that person either on bail with or without conditions. With Jordan on bail, the police investigation would continue, but Jordan would carry on his life, and around this time he decided to move on from his ex-partner Laura, and this is when he met Evie Adams. Evie Adams was born into a life of abuse, suffering great trauma with her birth family, until she was placed in foster care when she was just three years old. Her birth family was renowned in the area for being in trouble with the police, often leaving infant Evie to wander the streets at night with no supervision. When she was seven, they rung us up from the fostering agency and said they had two children, brother and sister, they wanted to keep them together, but it would only be temporary, could we take them? I said, yeah, no problem, and they never left. <laughs> Bernard and Yvonne Adams formally adopted Evie when she was just seven years old, giving her the loving family dynamic she had been lacking so much in her early years. We were very close. She always used to say to me, you're never ever going in an old folks home. If you need caring, I'll care for you. I said, what about your dad? Oh, well, he can sort his cell out, he'll be right. <laughs> On Evie's 16th birthday, she changed her surname to match that of her adoptive parents and her friends and family could see how special it was to her to carry the family name. She would proudly tell people that she was no longer the abused child she once was. She was a new woman who knew what she wanted, a career in hairdressing, a partner and a family of her own. Evie was a lively, bubbly girl who loved to go out with her friends, but also loved spending time at home with her parents. Her foster parents clearly had so much love for her and described her as full of life, crazy, outgoing, and she was always willing to help anyone. Evie, she was funny, dippy, loving, yeah, and very thoughtful. Really thoughtful, really, really good girl. When she was 17, Evie met Nathan, her seemingly perfect match, and by 20, she had a baby girl. A few years later, Evie and Nathan's relationship fell apart, so she moved into her own house with her baby, and later, in 2018, she matched with 28-year-old Jordan Monaghan on Tinder. Evie was almost immediately smitten. Jordan would do or buy anything to make her and her baby happy, doting on them endlessly and providing the life that Evie had always hoped for. However, despite his charming nature, Evie's friends and family were nervous about Jordan due to the rumours that were circulating around town. Bernard, Evie's adopted father, started asking about the man his daughter was dating, and this is when he started hearing the disturbing stories about Jordan. Everybody just jumped up bandwagon telling me this about him, telling me that about him, what he got away with, what he were like, people were going around said he was a child killer, and once they knew it was my daughter who were the floodgates just opened, I were getting told all sorts. He heard how Jordan was on bail for the murder of his two children, and how he often got away with everything, and that he was a known con man. It wasn't long before Evie was lying to her friends and family, and started to hide her relationship from them. I was never introduced to him, or I've never spoken to him. She just hid everything. Yvonne and Bernard were increasingly concerned for their daughter, and the situation drove a wedge between them. Evie became increasingly secretive and was only able to contact her friends and her family when she went to her dad's house and was away from Jordan. When they were out of friends, Evie would just be by Jordan's side the entire night appeasing him, when she was usually known to be dancing and having fun with her friends. She fell out with her friends. She couldn't have friends. Girls and I stopped all that. She couldn't go anywhere without him. It was a terrible time because he wanted to alienate her from everybody. She lost all her friends, but he couldn't totally alienate her from me. In 2018, when Jordan was first arrested on suspicion of murdering his two children and the attempted murder of a third, police took it upon themselves to warn Evie about the dangers of being of this man. They even went so far as to take her to a safe house and grant a restraining order against him. DC Pauline Stables said, It indicates the level of manipulation towards Evie to have maintained a relationship with him, regardless of the warnings she received from the police, social services and support services. 
when Jordan was released on bail due to there being no overwhelming evidence, the restraining order and non-molestation order were made in the context of care proceedings concerning Evie's daughter. Evie had disclosed to police that Jordan had attempted to burn down the home of Nathan, who was Evie's ex-boyfriend, and that he had told her he didn't care if the child was inside the house at the time. However, despite all the warnings and legal restrictions in place, the two were seen together multiple times over the course of 2018 and 2019. He did eventually plead guilty to breaking parole and was handed a 12-week suspended sentence, yet Evie turned up at court with him as a mode of support. Two more visits from social services found Jordan in the presence of Evie's child and she was removed from Evie's care to live with her grandparents. Evie's friends and family were baffled as to how Evie could let her child go for the sake of this relationship, especially as Jordan was no longer the loving and doting partner he once appeared to be. Her daughter was undoubtedly the most important thing in her life, so how could she give her up for this disgusting man? Friends of Evie recalled with a heavy heart many times when Jordan would shout and scream at her and show real aggression towards her. The murderer rumours were catching up with Jordan however, losing him work as companies didn't want to hire someone under investigation for killing children. Evie's world would crumble around her, she lost her house and her child and was bouncing between hostels and homeless shelters when she finally decided that enough was enough. Evie left town for a women's shelter in Kendall, a nearby town, hoping to gain back custody of her daughter once she was away from Jordan. However, even here she was unable to escape Jordan's menacing behaviour, calling her friends to tell her, he's following me everywhere I go. Evie eventually received a phone call telling her that Jordan was threatening to jump off a rooftop in Preston because she wouldn't see him. This led her to move back to Blackburn with Jordan, and in the space of three months, she became what friends described as a shadow and not Evie anymore. In October of 2019, not only was Evie struggling in her relationship, but it appeared that her health was also beginning to suffer. Over the weekend of the 11th to the 13th of October, Evie and Jordan went to Blackpool with a couple of friends, and while they were there, Jordan displayed a lot of aggressive behaviour, and an argument took place, which even caused Jordan to damage the caravan in which they were staying in. Their friends even recalled seeing Jordan give Evie some tablets from a brown glass bottle, which they thought was strange, as those glass bottles were discontinued many years ago, and medication was no longer in these glass bottles. Following that weekend, on the 14th of October, Evie ended the relationship, texting him, we're done, and she started looking for one bedroom flats for herself. The following day, however, the couple reconciled and got back together. Two days later, on the 17th of October, Evie began to feel unwell and started complaining of stomach pains. Over the next few days, Evie started looking at her symptoms online and deduced that she had some sort of stomach flu. She spoke to her father, who offered to come and get her and to take her to the doctor, but she assured him that all was okay. During this period, Jordan continuously gave her pills, giving her the impression that they would make her feel better. On the 20th of October, Evie messaged Jordan saying, I feel like I'm dying. I got a phone call. She sounded awful. She'd been ill all weekend, being sick and tummy aches and said you need to go to doctors. I'll make an appointment and pick you up if you want. No, I've got an appointment for tonight at tea time. I'm all right. Jordan made an appointment for Evie at the Oakenhurst surgery. However, as he was unable to take her, she missed the appointment. The following day, Jordan called 111, which is the NHS helpline, and he reported Evie's symptoms as four days of vomiting and dizziness and made an appointment for her at the St. Ives Medical Centre. Once again, however, Evie failed to turn up to this appointment. Jordan was continuously controlling any attempts to call doctors and to seek medical assistance. On the 22nd of October, Jordan went to the doctor by himself and requested prescription medication to help him sleep. Although the doctor didn't think he was suffering from depression, he prescribed a week's worth of medication which Jordan collected the same day. Evie confided in her friend, Holly, messaging her saying, Jordan keeps stressing and won't let me see a doctor. Once again, Jordan called 111 and he added symptoms of abdominal pain and blurred vision. When 111 returned the calls, no one answered. 
At 10 past 10 p.m., a message from Evie's phone was sent to Jordan saying, I took all them tablets you gave me today, as well as just took eight paracetamol because I don't want to live no more and I'll carry on taking more. On the 23rd of October, Jordan sent Evie a text saying, you still want to kill yourself? And got a response saying, yeah. This was also the day that Evie missed an arranged visit with her daughter and this is when her parents and friends knew that something was seriously wrong. The following day, on the 24th of October 2019, Jordan and Evie were staying in his aunt and uncle's house in Blackburn. Evie was in so much pain at this point, she was unable to walk. A message came through to Jordan's phone from Evie saying, Jordan, I don't want to be here anymore. I've taken some drugs and I don't want help. Tragically, at 8.15pm later that night, Jordan's aunt called 999 to request an ambulance for Evie. She had gone to check on Evie and had found her with blue lips and she was unresponsive. When Jordan arrived at the house, he told paramedics that Evie had taken four Zopiclone and two Tramadol pills that morning before he left the house. He told police he had given the pill packets to the paramedics, but the ambulance crew confirmed they had never been handed any packaging. Evie's parents, Bernard and Yvonne Adams, were later told the news that their daughter had died by suicide, but they immediately knew this wasn't true, and they felt that Jordan was hiding something. Thursday night, about half past ten, and then to be told it was suicide, I thought, no. Nah. I just said to him, were it tablets? He said, yeah, it were. The first thing I said, I bet it's, I bet it's him, and then day after, two police ladies came and said they didn't think it was suicide, they thought it was murder. Despite Evie's death originally being ruled a suicide, once they found out that Evie Adams was linked to Jordan Monaghan, they started to realise a different theory. With a little bit of digging, they would establish that actually she was in a relationship with Jordan Monaghan, who is currently on bail for the murder of his two children. And having had that information, I would have been highly suspicious around the circumstances of the death of Evie at that point, and I would have been reluctant to call it a suicide at that stage. Jordan quickly became the key suspect in the suspected homicide, but without evidence, they had no means to arrest him. Over the next few days after Evie's death, Jordan played the role of a grieving partner very well. Evie's family members at the time noted that he seemed to be trying to control Evie even in death, as he would interrupt funeral arrangements and make threats regarding where the wake would be held. Evie's family actually removed her body and had it transferred to a different morgue, as they were so fearful Jordan would break in and try and harm her. When the post-mortem results came through, it was concluded that Evie died by overdose of tramadol and diazepam, having taken a large number of sedative and depressive drugs over several days. It was clear from the results that she had died due to drug toxicity. The levels of tramadol in her toxicology report suggested she had taken 20 tablets, not the two Jordan had originally described, and this dose had been fatal. On the 6th of November, Evie's friend, Kimberly, travelled to Jordan's parents' house in Belgrave Close to help with the funeral arrangements. Jordan told her that he wanted to put his favourite picture of himself and Evie in her coffin, and as he opened the back of the picture frame, two letters fell out. One was addressed to Evie's daughter, and the other was a suicide note, apparently written by Evie before her death. It was clear to authorities that Jordan was really trying to make this look like a suicide, but they had to find some evidence to link Jordan to Evie's death. They also believed that if they managed to link Evie's death to Jordan, it would also help in linking Logan and Ruby's deaths to Jordan. A group of 12 experts in a range of different disciplines looked into all three deaths once again, trying to find hard evidence that could lead to an arrest. Finally, almost a year after Evie died, the breakthrough was found. There were no stab wounds, there was no trauma to Evie, and so one has to come to the conclusion that she's died through some kind of internal mechanism, and poisoning being the suggestion. And so the police will be looking at all lines of inquiry. What are the types of medication that have been found in Evie's toxicology? Are those types of medicines within the household? Has she had them prescribed to her? Do family members have those prescribed to her as well? Have they been purchasing those items on the black market? And if so, who's been doing that and how have they done that? How have they paid for those items? In January 2021, the massive investigation into the deaths of Ruby and Logan Monaghan and Evie Adams and the attempted murder of a third child on two occasions 
finally led to Jordan Monaghan's arrest. He faced one single trial for all of his crimes, taking place over a period of 10 weeks at Preston Crown Court. The police prosecuting all three murders at the same time was a good decision. The complexities around the death of the children is really challenging for a jury to try and understand and get their head around. I think when you add on the case of Evie to that, it strengthens the case and it shows a pattern of behaviour and there's a lot of similar fact evidence that one can show that says this is the personality of Jordan Monaghan, this is the sort of individual he is and this is what he's capable of doing. Evidence was uncovered that categorically proved that Jordan had purchased and administered the drugs that were found in Evie's toxicology report post-mortem. Jordan had been on a WhatsApp group called UK Tablets and this is where he had sourced the multiple prescription medications that were the cause of Evie's death. Messages from Jordan to the group were found as early as October 17, 2019, asking for multiple drugs. On October 21st, the day of one of Evie's missed doctor's appointments, Jordan messaged the UK Tablets group asking, You got blues, mate? referring to diazepam. He had messaged this just eight minutes after the missed appointment. While Evie had been suffering at home, both physically and psychologically, Jordan had taken her phone and laptop out with him, completely cutting her off from the outside world and giving her no access to help, as well as fabricating messages from her phone and sending them to himself. We have phone technology that can place a mask to know where your phone is. Jordan was in the same room as Evie when the texts were sent, and that's really what put the nail in the coffin, because he lied, he said he was elsewhere, he wasn't. Phone masks and phone records show he was in that flat at the time of that death. The suicide note, which was conveniently found at his parents' house, was also confirmed to not have been written by Evie and that it was written by Jordan himself. The way it had been written was very suspicious, saying, I'm going to kill myself, but Jordan has absolutely nothing to do with it, which roused suspicion immediately. It was found that her fingerprints were not on it, but his fingerprints were. One of the witnesses at the trial was taxi driver Zahid Abbas, who knew Jordan as a regular customer who often travelled with a young child in a pram. Abbas recalled that on the day of Logan's death, he collected Jordan and Logan from their home at New Chapel Street and that the child had been happy, talking and acting normal throughout the journey. Upon arrival, Jordan had given Logan money, which Logan cheerfully passed over to Abbas. A second witness from the same day was Kaylee Hughes, who was working reception at Waves Pool on the rainy afternoon that Jordan and Logan arrived. She remembered seeing them and thought it was odd that Jordan was wearing a thick grey jumper because the water park was so hot and people usually wore t-shirts or vests. At 2.06pm, Jordan paid for the swim and walked towards the changing area. Only 27 minutes later, at 2.43pm, he returned past reception and straight out the exit, with the rain cover hiding Logan in the pushchair. Kaylee said, it seemed a bit strange because it was such a short period of time and he didn't ask for a refund or speak to anyone on reception. Reflecting back on the day, Logan's mother Laura said, Jordan hated swimming, he'd never been, and that neither he nor Logan had swimming trunks on them when they left. It was later concluded that Jordan had murdered Logan in the privacy of a changing cubicle by smothering his nose and mouth. In a cubicle in the swimming baths, he smothered his son, put him back into his push chair and covered him with a raincoat and wheeled him home. Jordan deliberately said, I'm going to go and collect pizza so that Laura would have to be the one to find her son dead. Laura also noted that Ruby's circumstances were also strange. When I found Ruby, she was covered with a blanket. Looking back, that didn't make sense. Surely if she wasn't breathing, he would have uncovered her. Mr. Justice Goose, in his original sentencing of Jordan Monaghan, said that the trigger for these offences was usually because of your volatile relationships and that a striking feature of these offences is that you carried them out calmly and secretively. Speaking specifically on the murder of Evie Adams, Mr. Justice Goose said, you tricked her into thinking the drugs would make her better, but they made her worse and that she had suffered in great pain before she died. After a jury deliberation of 26 hours and 12 minutes, Jordan Monaghan was sentenced to three life sentences with a minimum term of 40 years before being eligible for parole. Speaking on Jordan's appearance in court, people said he didn't look remotely guilty or sorry, but instead he sat slouching at the back as if he was almost bored. We're 
went to the trial, sat there every day, listening to all the evidence they had against him. And of course, we didn't know any of this because we couldn't be told beforehand. And some of it was horrific. But when he gave his evidence, it was so calm, so calculated. No emotion. And I thought, you haven't got an emotion in your body. Personal impact statements were heard from Logan and Ruby's mother, Laura Gray, from Evie's father, Bernard Adams, and Evie's sister, Victoria Astley each giving a harrowing tale of loss and ongoing suffering at the hands of Jordan Monaghan. However, there was dissatisfaction with the length of this punishment, based on the exceptionally high seriousness of the offending. With no mitigating circumstances and aggravating factors, including long-term psychological damage to Laura Gray and her third child, the fact that Jordan attempted murder on five separate occasions and that the murder of Evie Adams took exceptional planning, it was submitted that the minimum term of 40 years was unduly lenient. Jordan Monaghan, who was convicted on the 17th of December 2021 of three counts of murder and two counts of attempted murder. He was sentenced to imprisonment for life with a minimum term of 40 years. However, the court is satisfied that the minimum term imposed by the judge was unduly lenient and substituted a minimum term of 48 years. Jordan didn't appear in court that day due to what was only listed as minor illness. Instead, he appeared via webcam from His Majesty's prison, Wakefield. I, I wanted to kill him, honestly. I, I wanted to kill him. If I'd seen him walking across the road, I'd have run him over. Although no amount of time in prison can bring back the lives of the loved ones lost, hopefully some solace can be found in the fact that Jordan Monaghan will not be eligible for parole until he is in his 70s, ensuring history cannot repeat itself on other women or children children who encounter him. Jordan Monaghan is a master manipulator. He gave multiple interviews to the British media, claiming that both of his children had been snatched from him by an unknown medical crisis, gaslighting his fiancée into believing she could be to blame, sending messages from Evie's phone to his own to fabricate suicide, and keeping both Evie and Laura Gray under his thumb despite multiple attempts to leave. Laura Gray is now with a new partner and she hopes to start a new family in this new happy relationship. She also told media that she would try and remove the word daddy from both Logan and Ruby's tombstones. I don't think I'll ever be the same. I don't know how you can. Life and soul at party, will not you? You get up in the middle, dance the middle of the floor, you get everybody, go around and drag everybody up. Just, that's, that's the type of person she were, singing out a tune on top of her voice. What are you trying to sing there? Is it, is it a new song? Huh? I've never heard of that one. Of course you have, it's a... Oh, it don't sound like that to me. <laughs> Just laugh. You've got to laugh, you know, good times. Mm. Yeah, I, I don't miss. Honestly, Jordan Monaghan is such a monster, and this was such a hard case to talk about. Words can't even describe how disgusted I am in this man, who not only took the life of Evie Adams, but of his own children. Ruby and Logan's lives had barely started, and he took their lives away from them. Honestly, my heart goes out to every single person who's been impacted by these horrible crimes in one way or another. And rest in peace to Logan Monaghan, Ruby Monaghan and Evie Adams.